Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Come on in. There are some, uh, there are some additional empty seats. Well, a few of them, although they're going. Are these reserved for somebody? Or are they for us, allegedly? What does that say? There's a few more seats if you wander up this direction. Is it good? Okay, we got reserved. There's one here. We got a lot of friendly people here at KubeCon, so make some friends. We got uh, empty seats there. Maybe raise your hand if you got an empty seat next to you, uh, and you're and you're interested to meet a new KubeCon or. Well, we got tons of them up here. Come on in, make room. Uh, we're going to talk about CERN and what they've done with the operator framework to make their lives easier. Um, I am uh, Michael from Red Hat. This is Varsha. We're operator framework contributors and, uh, and maintainers over various times. We also have here with us uh, Francisco and Rajula. They're SREs at CERN. And we're going to talk about uh, how we came together. Their operator they created caught our eye. Uh, so they're going to introduce what they've done. We'll discuss a bit amongst ourselves some observations about what they've done, their experience. We'll have some discussion over here and then invite you to ask your questions and, and join in that discussion uh, in the latter portion of this. So thank you again for coming. And uh, Rajula, please take it away. Uh, it's just a quick bit of intro about CERN. So we are the Center for European Nuclear Research. Uh, we are the world's largest, uh, largest and the biggest uh, particle accelerator. Uh, this is a, one of the accelerators where we collide uh, subatomic particles. This is called ATLAS. Just to give a bit of a glimpse, this weighs almost 7,000 tons, which is equal to the weight of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and this is uh, the collider. So it's a LHC. Uh, it's around 27 kilometers in diameter. And you see the Geneva Lake and the Swiss Alps in the background. And it's not just physics what we do. So CERN is also a place where the World Wide Web was invented. And we actually do a bit more than just that. So we have a lot of member states from around the world. And the main source of collaboration and communication happens through websites. So we host a lot of websites. So we specifically come from the team where we host publicly uh, available websites like home.cern and atlas.cern. So just a quick glimpse of uh, our infrastructure. So we manage uh, content management systems. Basically, it's Drupal instances. So the users basically can create, update, and delete without uh, a lot of technical knowledge. And we want each of these instances to have a life cycle to be autonomous and isolated. And we also want to enforce all the dependent resources. And uh, uh, the same instances should also be integrated with certain specific stuff like SSO, databases, and backups. So why operator? The first reason would be time saving, because we wanted to create uh, and delete sites on the fly. So at this point, we have around 1,000 600 websites, of them 800 or 900 production websites. So we create previews and test sites on the fly. And standardization, so we wanted to reduce inconsistencies and errors with manual creations. So with operator, we have a standard of configuration and the flavor of quality of service. And scalability, we want to scale up. So if there's a new version of Drupal and we can just want to create a preview for all the production websites, we can just double the number of sites. And we have quite a large number of instances, like I mentioned, and access control. So we also want to have a fine-grained access control of what the users can do, uh, what they can access on the sites, and self-healing. Uh, of course, so if someone deletes some of the resources, the operator should be able to heal everything back and bring everything back to normal. This is a user portal that we have for the interface to the operator. So most of our users are non-technical users. So they use this interface. They just mention the URL they want and the version they want. And, and this translates to a custom resource definition, which is basically just basic stuff. It just spins up a site with a database, with integration with SSO, and everything else. Is the operator publicly available? So a lot of stuff is CERN specific in our operator right now. We use a lot of our internal databases. We integrate with our own SSO. And we assume that we retrieve images and push images to our own image registry. And we also assume our, our own GitLab instance. So it's technically not open source, but it was a consequence of our design because of the academic environment. The code is publicly available. Yet there are a lot of integrations that are coupled with the operator. So I'll hand over to Michael. 
Great. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction. So we've seen a little bit about what they've done. And um, so now Varsha and I have had some discussions with Francisco and Rajula. Uh, we've looked through their code. And uh, one of the things that really caught our eye and really led to this collaboration and this analysis that we're doing together here is just the fact that they've created an operator as real end users. They are the human operators themselves. We see a lot of discussion and a lot of attention given toward, it's perfectly reasonable, um, like often vendors creating an operator to install their software for their customers and their end users. Uh, but much of the operator pattern really shines when it is the SREs, the operators themselves, creating the Kubernetes operator to, to help them. And uh, these guys even referred to this operator. It's two of them maintaining this incredible number of websites and this infrastructure around it. The operator is the third member of their team and the only one who's working today. Uh, so so that, that's really neat. And uh, it's, it's fascinating, I think, to get that perspective and that view on, on what it is like, what the experience has been like to develop and, and create an operator. So one of the things that, for me in particular, caught my eye is the multi-tenant aspect and the self-service aspect of this. So just for a brief moment on multi-tenancy, what this is, what this means to us, is we have multiple users or groups of users, we would call tenants, right, sharing some pool of resources. Uh, probably most of us use like an email service and a calendar service and some kind of, you know, office document uh, product that's delivered to us over the internet as a, as a service, right? That is, those are all multi-tenant back-end kinds of systems. Tenants have discrete data that needs to stay separate from each other. So my email is separate from your email, is separate from somebody else's email, and we depend on the services to keep those things separate. This is a common characteristic of delivering software as a service or in this case, some kind of a, a software in a self-service fashion. And we can write applications natively to handle that separation, uh, but many vendors and software producers have older school or existing software that is single tenant, something like Drupal uh, or WordPress or some other kind of web application like that, uh, or maybe something very domain specific. Maybe it's a, an accounting uh, software. I'm from the US, so taxes are on my mind right now. Uh, we just had that, that day go by. Uh, so if you have a single tenant web application or some service like that, you can still offer it in a self-service way, in perhaps even a software as a service subscription kind of way by using Kubernetes namespaces. Uh, and so that is what namespace level tenancy is. Uh, every tenant that you have gets a unique namespace in a Kubernetes cluster and we just deploy a copy of the application for them in that space. It may include a data store that's unique to them. It may not. Maybe there's a shared database management service that's, that's external or, or in some way is uh, joined. Um, but one way or another, we're enforcing that isolation with namespaces. This gives us a pretty easy on-ramp and an easy path to delivering uh, a single tenant application potentially in a self-service or even a SaaS model. Um, and, and that's what they've done here. So I think it's a really interesting example of that. Now I'll hand it off to Varsha. Uh, coming on to the next uh, observable part, uh, we all know operators handle a lot of complex applications and there are a lot of moving paths too. Now having metrics, alerts, and visualization is an important aspect and they constitute what is known as operator observability. Now, collecting metrics helps us in providing a deeper insight about what an operator does and how is it behaving, whether it's behaving as expected. And having alerts helps SREs and cluster admins to make sure that cases do not turn to be critical so that we don't have to wake up in the night. And visualization helps us in getting a better understanding of these complex moving paths. Now, some of the key reasons why operator observability is important and something which we advocate while writing operators is one, to quantitatively understand the deployment success rate, in turn, the number of successful deployments of the operator workloads which are running on cluster. Two, having continuous health checks that uh, ensures that the operator is performing as expected at any instant of time. The third and the most important is resource utilization. So having an idea on the resource utilization on cluster by the operator helps in providing a better understanding of how the operator is performing and if there is anything which we as operator authors can do to improve the performance. There are a lot of metrics which uh, we have from controller runtime. We'll talk about that in a bit. 
But the other two important aspects are scaling and availability. And they measure how well an operator is able to scale, at what instant of time, at what workload. And availability is basically the percentage of time the operator and its workloads are available in action doing stuff which we want them to do. So we have a doc on the best practices on metrics related to operator SDK. It has in-depth details on how alerts should be set up, what are the labels, and other suggested formats. Now, as operator SDK users, what does it provide to all with respect to monitoring metrics and visualization stuff? So there are three things which SDK provides us. Uh, the first one is the controller and time metrics. So we all know that operator SDK uses a library, which is known as controller and time. And it exposes a set of controller or reconciler metrics to be specific. Now, what they are and how they are useful, uh, I'll briefly cover it in the next slide. But moving on to the second point is when you build an operator with SDK, you get a manifest which creates a service monitor. Now, using the service monitor, you can integrate the operator uh, metrics. Uh, you can expose the operator metrics and push it to an Prometheus operator or any standalone Prometheus instance running on cluster. So the metrics are available at the endpoint. It's just up to us to scrape them, see them, and visualize them. And the third most interesting and beautiful aspect of this is the availability of a Grafana V1 Alpha plugin. So this plugin is available on QBuilder, which can again be used in operator SDK. What it does is it scaffolds out, uh, scaffolds out a JSON blob. And you can copy this JSON blob, put it into a Grafana instance, and you get the visualization of the metrics which you have collected. So we went through the Drupal operator code. And these are the few metrics which we thought would have been helpful to the SREs and to the CERN folks, and also in general to all of you when you all start writing an operator, or you all try uh, getting metrics from an existing operator. So some of the controller runtime metrics to briefly go over are total number of reconciles, the number of errors during reconciliation, and the duration of a reconcile in a controller. So these metrics give an overall idea on the performance of controller. They help in monitoring the health of the controller and identifying any issue or any request, which is possibly blocking or taking a lot more time than expected. And the other two uh, metrics which we thought would have been useful are the available backups and the scheduled backups. But the idea is using the tools available, we can also extend them to create our own custom metrics. And this is something which we recommend. So uh, the recommendation is to have as many metrics as possible, which are custom to your application logic and having a visualization out of them to better understand the operator performance. Moving on to the internal discussion. Great. Let's have a seat. Yep. And uh, let me turn on. Live. Hello. Whoop. Okay. There's a switch on the bottom, but mine was on. So we're going to have a bit of a discussion. Uh, this is fantastic. Thank you for the chairs. We were envisioning maybe some couches and some coffees or something like this. Um, so that's at least what we're, what we're going for here. So we, we thought about some questions and some um, maybe discussion and a little more of the story of what the experience was like. So maybe could you guys just elaborate a bit to start with us on how did you get to the point of you wanted to use Kubernetes at all and, and write an operator? And what was that experience like of actually creating this thing from the ground up? OK, so uh, first off, we were a bit lucky in the sense that we already had uh, another Kubernetes-based services around. Uh, it was, a, a logically wise, more simple. But it proved that we could have our CMSs um, on the same platform. So once we understood that uh, Kubernetes would be a place where we could put our Drupal websites, so our public websites. We then started the development of this operator, which is very logic heavy. Uh, it was written in Go, which was the one more flexible, more capable of being custom. Um, and well, it was it was a, a learning process. So we, we discussed this already before. Uh, it was, let's say, our first big operator. It was very logic intensive. And we did not realize in the beginning how we were making some mistakes. 
So um, this is, for, for example, one, one very simple but crucial mistake is that we created one very long controller which was handling a lot of logic. So in the end, the, the reconciliation loop, as you guys can imagine, was very long. Um, we initially, because the operator is, and it still is super fast, uh, once it started to take more than just a few seconds, we started realizing that there was something that design-wise was not great. So we were basically from that point on uh, doing smaller adjustments and improvements on the operator in order to basically keep the performance we wanted. Now, you're both, before we dive into that topic a little yeah. deeper, uh, I mean, you're both accomplished SREs. What was, what was that like writing in Go? Were you already comfortable writing in Go? Was that a big learning curve itself? And how was controller runtime and the whole, that whole experience around it? Okay, uh, from my side, my experience, I was not a very uh, big Golang developer at all. Uh, I had previous experience with many languages, but Go, it was very basic. Um, writing the uh, Golang operator was, I, I didn't find it a big of a challenge. It was very easy to understand the code structure, uh, the, me the methods that I needed when I needed. Uh, so I would say it was fairly easy. Yeah, so um, as they mentioned, having a very long reconciler is something which is not useful. And a suggested pattern is to break down the reconciler into multiple different parts. Now, one thing which we wanted to highlight as operator of uh, SDK developers is that can bring a kind of issue in terms of how, may, how many CRDs does a controller manage. So the suggested pattern is to have just one CRD per controller. And just to quickly highlight the reason behind that, is that if there are if there's a CRD which is being managed by multiple controllers, there can be contention of the update. So multiple controllers can update a single field, and that can cause ra uh, issues uh, in terms of uh, causing race conditions. And debugging race conditions is definitely a, mo a major pain point, which we would suggest never to do so. So I think you guys also had some similar conclusions and ended up going from your like long reconcile function and thinking about how to, to break that apart into multiple, right? What was that like? Um, well, so in, in our case, we don't do uh, what you would say as a correct approach. So we use more than one controller for the same custom resource, but we define that on this resource that would be a sub resource that would only be managed by a separate controller. So what we did was we had the basically, and this is how, how it actually went, our operator was managing the backups and the backups were taking very long. So we separated that into a different controller and then it's, it's completely fine because they are basically separated even though they use the same custom resource. Yeah, and there, there's a couple of knobs here I guess we can try to turn to, to deal with that particular issue. One of the first things we, we think about is controller runtime defaults, of course, to only doing a single reconcile at a time. And we can configure, and in fact, that's a good idea for any of you who are maintaining operators or thinking about creating operators. Go look at that setting. Think about enabling it to uh, reconcile multiple. Do you recall what we call that? It's max, re max concurrent re reconciles. That's right. Uh, is one of the options there on the manager, I think, right? So did you start with that? Did you try multiple, and how did that go? Yeah, we actually tried with that, but our problem remained the same. So now we have more, but they all get basically stuck in this one operation that is very time intensive, uh, but it's not very high priority. So we realized this is a low priority task that takes a long time. So for us, even though we basically increased the number of reconciles, it just made more sense to have these, uh, let's say, operations decoupled into different reconciliations. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Rajul, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, so... There were some parts of the status. We had just wanted to always have the status as a priority. So even with the slow task, the other reconciles were putting the status up to date, so which was kind of useful. Interesting, yes. Status management is always a, a tricky thing to get right sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so another thing that caught our eye about your API in particular, I love looking at API choices and design. Uh, ooh, well done. Uh, is... Uh, the fact that the Drupal version is actually embedded into the spec. We typically, uh, I mean, the way we develop operators at Red Hat and what we recommend operator developers usually to do is to couple the version of the operator with the version of the operand. So if you want to upgrade, for example, Drupal, you would upgrade the operator. And that enables you to 
to limit the scope so that your operator logic always knows what version of the operand it's going to be dealing with, uh, or maybe it's just upgrading from this one to that one. Um, you've, I think, need some more flexibility than that, I understand, uh, for your use case and your user base and some, some flexibility. Uh, could you maybe tell us a bit more about how that went and what you did in the API here to actually get that flexibility. Uh, for us, the version is basically the serving image. It's just an image tag. So it's not related to any of the resources because everything else is the same resource. So the version change on the CRD will just change the serving image on the deployment. Anything else? No, I, I was just going to say that the operator itself is basically agnostic to the version because the expected operations for all of them is still the same MySQL database, etc. So it will still be able to do uh, database backup or restore and so on and so forth. So it's like I said, like my colleague said, it's just a serving image. The operator is completely agnostic. We can provide a second, a third image, and the operator will be able to serve all of them uh, without any fuss. And I think through your portal, do I recall correctly, you were able to give people some flexibility in terms of like when their particular instance is going to get upgraded, for example? That's correct. So um, the, web, the version itself of the CMS evolves through time. Users have to upgrade. And if we just upgrade them all at once, we might risk putting some websites offline because they have something that was not compatible with the latest version. So we basically announce ahead that we have a new version that they can try, they can install, and they can easily create a copy, which is this other custom resource that they're just going to create. Uh, have a new website running with the latest version. They can compare. They can basically then change the URLs to the to the copy. They can just then upgrade the the previous website, and then. Uh, changing the, the, the version is basically you go to the portal, you select a new version, that changes the custom resource, operator reads it, okay, there's a new image to serve, is it a different version? So if it's a different version, I have these operations to do, and then it upgrades, and then it's back online, and like nothing was ever done. So me and my colleague had nothing to do, our third colleague took care of that upgrade for us. So you can come to Amsterdam and uh, and speak at KubeCon. Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, maybe we should uh, get them in on this. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Great. Well, let's. Uh, <laughs> we have now it's your opportunity to ask some questions of uh, some CERN folks and Operator Framework, and uh, I've got already got a hand up here. Please go ahead. I'm not sure if we have mics running around there's, or there's mics on the I see side. See a couple mics on the wings. Um, why don't I just come give this to you for now and other folks, maybe if you want to make your way to one of those. Hi there. Thanks for the, for the talk and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, just a quick question on, or two rather, on the, so the base conference, but uh, to bring up the GUI. Yeah. Uh, how much flexibility does a user have if he wants to, can he go crazy and do a hundred of them? And what is behind it? So it dumps the CRD somewhere, but the website where you create this request, is that running on the cluster where the CRD will end up? Uh, that will trigger the operator? I, I, I'm not sure if I, I completely understood, but you're asking basically what connects the graphical interface with the cluster? Yeah, exactly, because in there you would request... Yeah, a, so a, yeah. basically the, in, in the website you basically uh, create whatever and that impersonates for you an operation behind the scenes which would be either create or update this custom resource or even delete it. So all the CRUD oper oper operations are done behind the scenes and in the portal you just have the fancy buttons and it's basically impersonation. Okay, but how does it get there on the cluster itself? If, if it... Uh, yeah, it has a service account, so it's basically a dedicated account and within the cluster it does impersonation. So it apply applies the operation with the authenticated user account. So you will only be okay. able to do the things in the cluster that you actually can do. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. I, it's, it's a bit more complex, but that's basically the, the small line. Uh, we, we're happy to have a further discussion if you want a bit more of details on that. So is your, your internal identity management is connected and set up for your cluster? Yeah, so we have role bindings within the cluster, et cetera. So it's part of, let's say, our namespace template. So when you create a new project, a new website, there's like already uh, roles there. So you can only, let's say, work with that specific namespace, with specific resources within that specific namespace. So basically, that's how everything gets managed. Uh, and well, that's it. Uh, thank you for amazing work. If I understand correctly, you are together uh, handle big load due to operator. And it's very efficient way of working. But what I'm afraid, did it free for you time to learn something 
better, learn something new, or just instead you're squeezed up to the last drop and just get more, um, more domains to handle instead of free your personal time? I would say that the operator definitely freed a lot of work from us. So we are definitely very happy with the solution we have. Actually, we are very happy and we still agree that there's improvements on the operator, but it basically released a lot of operation and a lot of work from us. So a lot of operations that would have needed to be done by us, as soon as we notice, oh, this is something systematic that users might need, we introduce it into the operator. And from that moment on, our third colleague takes care of all these operations for us. So let's say in the short term, we might have to do some extra development to introduce the operator, but medium to long term, it eases us, uh, it eases our lives in terms of uh, daily tasks um, on the infrastructure. Who else? Here we are. Someone is doing exercise today. Hello. Hi. I happen to be one of the main users of this service. <laughs> I know. I know Francisco. Hello. We had some uh, some uh, some conversations, and uh, my question is more about the downside of uh, creating an operator because. I'm not very familiar on, on operators or maintaining them, but do you think it's any downside uh, having an operator and something that is software-based rather than having some other type of solution like Helm Chart or an Argo CD instance or something the like? Uh, so if you're asking if we wanted something more of GitOps kind of thing, so in the sense that you have a repository and you have some specific thing for that, uh, well, you're at CERN, so y there's also a service that allows you to, if you want something custom with a sp specific Im image, Elm chart, whatever, there's a specific dedicated place for that. The, the goal with our service is providing a software out of the box. So you as a user don't have to have a lot of technical knowledge and you get a website up and running. And our operator basically enables us to do that very easily without a lot of a actual work to keep the things running. So Thanks. I'm not sure if it answered, but... Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, typically maybe just to add a thought to that, uh, and I'll come to you, and then you. Uh, you know, operators. We talked a little bit about this as well. Like maybe GitOps is an option here, or you know, but that gets you a deployment story and maybe a deprovisioning story also, but not the continuous operational story here. That it's not the let's go, you know, have fun and go to dinner in Amsterdam and not worry about what might happen because there's an actor ready to react to, to unexpected cha or expected changes in state you know, the whole time. So that's, yeah. that's the story we yeah. tell at, at the operator framework. Uh, and actually, one thing that I might add is that, uh, for example, for some specific users that might want to do extra uh, things with their websites, we actually provide them permissions to, for example, work with the deployments, change the config maps, and so on and so forth. And one thing that you actually realize is that the operator even even in well protects them from certain mistakes because if you delete the deployment, don't worry, the, the deployment will be back very soon after because the operator will enforce it. So it also has that into uh, to to be in place and also help us with probable uh, accidental operations. That's it. We do sometimes see, and this gives an opportunity potentially. Uh, a mix of these, uh, where it might, you might use GitOps or some kind of pipeline like that to actually create the CRDs that still an operator uh, might use. So then that just moves the source of truth out of the cluster and into a Git repo, which has its advantages potentially. Yeah. But it's another thing yeah. to deal with. Yeah, that's a different topic, I would say. Okay, who is over here? There you go. Um, hi. Uh, as you already mentioned, status updates tend to be tricky, I've been there. Um, are there any best practices or, or tips you'd like to share? Like, uh, is it worth having a separate reconciler just for the status, decoupled from the main logic? Or uh, what are your thoughts? Varsha, do you have any thoughts on this first? It depends on, it depends on the business logic. It, uh, regarding the status updates, it depends on the uh, application logic. Uh, I don't think we have special recommendation on having a separate reconciler just for doing that. But in general, what we suggest is to use status conditionals so that whenever a status is updated, the uh, when the operator updates the status, 
the third person who is looking at the operator status knows the reason behind what's happening. It's a way to communicate to the user on why a status has been updated, what is happening in the reconciler loop, and what is a cause of an error, a failure, or a success. So using status conditional is something we would suggest, but having a separate reconciler just for doing so is uh, something we haven't, uh, it's something which is not so common. Yeah, there are a few uh, ideas and best practices, like uh, sometimes if you, you know, only write the status if you know there's a change to the status. Don't just blindly write an update to the status on every reconcile. That can be a significant help. And then when you do need to, uh, to do a write, doing a patch instead of a full apply uh, is a much lighter burden, at least on the API service. So we, like for example, with OpenShift, OpenShift is based on operators you know, top to bottom, and we're very sensitive about the burden we put on the API server, and so patching is a very important part of that as opposed to the entire uh, you know, safe update workflow. So there's a couple ideas. Okay. Or did you guys have anything that? Oh, on? No, no. Okay. It's good. All right. All right. <laughs> Somebody was over here. I promise to come back. Okay, here we are. Hello. I have a question. Is there any work involved to keep your operator uh, compatible with different Kubernetes version? Sorry, I cannot. You cannot hear me? Good. I, I, I could not hear it. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. So is there any work involved to keep the operator compatible with a different Kubernetes version? Uh, you're asking if our operator is compatible uh, with the Kubernetes version and now we upgraded? Uh, yeah, do you have to do any work with your operator maintaining it yeah. as the version of Kubernetes changes underneath it? It's a very good question. So we wrote this operator and went into production around two years ago. So two years ago, it's basically where we said, okay, this is good enough to start handling production workloads. And um, ever since we have not upgraded operator, so the operator has remained more or less in the same version. We didn't have the need so far to upgrade it. Uh, we are actually planning on doing it in the upcoming months, but there's no actual need. So currently, uh, up until now, it has been very good with uh, the upgrades of the cluster. So the cluster has been up upgraded ever since with the latest version, but the operator itself remains in the same version and it's very compatible. So it's very easy to uh, keep and keep it running. Yeah, also the APIs we use... Just talk right into it. Uh, so the APIs we use haven't changed much in Kubernetes, like the client APIs. So it's totally fine that we are using an older client but a new server. Uh, well, for one last question for you two, if you were to maybe think about it, even perhaps in the near future, do this again, start from scratch, what, what would you do different? It's a very good question. So there's a few things that we guaranteedly would do differently. So we already learned the lesson about big reconciled loops that would not happen again. Um, a, a second thing is metrics. So we are aware that the operator exposes metrics, but we never use them. So we some, at some point realized our operator was slow, but we never had actually proper visualization of that. So one second thing is from day one, we would, proper, we would definitely monitor our operator workload, see how it w handles the workload, how fast it is, and what's going on with it. So these are definitely two, two big points about it that we would take into consideration. One third point is that we actually, in terms of uh, the architecture of the custom resource, looks really good and we would probably keep the same, which is it's one custom resource to deploy, uh, to deploy and handle everything about the software that we would keep for sure because it, it works pretty well with us. It's one single point of information to provide everything for a user. Yeah, nice. Virgil, any thoughts from you too? I think mostly we will also focus on more testing, better unit testing. And also, we don't use all the latest features that come with the operator SDK. So we don't have that much of time to actually focus on it. But if you have it, able to write a new one, I think we would start with that first and follow up with new features. Yeah, very nice. Farsha, any, any parting thoughts? Um, yeah, probably testing metrics um, and yeah, the upgrade process. Are, I think they covered it all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, say goodbye. Uh, we have one last request for you. This is a QR code where you can tell us how we did. Uh, we'd love your feedback. Uh, positive feedback is also helpful if you just had a good time. It's helpful for us to hear and for our bosses to hear who sent us here. Uh, 
But we'll stick around up here. We've, we can stay in the room, I guess, for a little bit more time. And, uh, and then we can go outside too if you got, there's a lot more topics we could cover. Um, so bring your questions, bring your, uh, last time we did this, uh, something similar, we got some pretty good confessions about uh, real world horror stories and mistakes and things gone wrong. So come on up, share, listen, and thank you for coming.